uh, welcome to our first um, Max Weber Foundation Web Forum uh, on the digital transformation. And our topic today is knowledge production in a data-driven society. I'm very happy that we have uh, three excellent experts on this topic, and they will talk about different aspects of the digital transformation of knowledge production in a digital uh, society. Um, the first speaker, Yoshiaki Fukami, um, who is um, a professor at Gakshuin University and visiting researcher at the School of Medicine at Keio University. He will speak about the limits of big data and AI, and he will cover uh, the, uh, uh, especially not only the technical aspects of data architecture, but also social aspects such as trust and uh, ethical questions. Then we have as a second presenter, we have Nadine He, who is now in, in Osaka, professor of global history at Osaka University. She was associate professor for global history of knowledge at the uh, Freie University of Berlin and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. And she will talk about um, knowledge production, knowledge in the digital age as a commons and about the changing patterns of knowing and empowerment, especially also about the sort of new epistemologies, um, maybe empowering even indigenous knowledge. And last but not least, um, we have Iti Abraham, a professor and head of the Department of Southeast Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. He's a political scientist and he will talk about the changing boundaries between the public and the private that we observe um, that sort of uh, go along with the digital transformation. So all together, of course, the topic of knowledge production in the digital age, it's a very broad and wide topic. There are many aspects to it. And I think we cover three very important issues uh, tonight. We're not talking about the technicalities of um, algorithms and deep learning, but we're talking about the social and political consequences of this new type, a new kind of knowledge production. And so I think uh, from these very different uh, perspectives and talking about these very important uh, issues, um, we should also expect a fruitful exchange afterwards. Now, let me explain how we will go on. We'll first have the three presentations, um, basically in a row, um, each uh, between 15 minutes and 20 minutes. And we'll start, as in the program, we'll start with uh, Yoshiaki Fukami, and then Nadine He, and uh, then Iti Abraham. And after these um, presentations, we'll have a short round of um, feedback uh, from among the speakers. The speakers have the possibility to react to each other. And then we'll open the discussion uh, to the floor. So anytime uh, you can put a question in the chat and um, my colleague Harald Kümmerle, whom you also see here, he is basically managing the chat. He will uh, take up your questions and will feed them into the discussion later on. And so please feel free uh, to post your, post your questions uh, during even already, you don't have to wait till we open up the Q&A, you can post your questions anytime. So without further ado, um, I would like to, to start uh, with our um, uh, presentation today and I will give the word to um, Yoshiaki um, Fukami and uh, he will talk about knowledge production, the limits of big data and AI. Uh, Yoshiaki, please. Thank you for your introduction, and uh, I'm very happy. And thank you for your uh, good good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your uh, participation of this uh, event and presentation. I'd like to give a presentation titled "With uh, Knowledge Production: The Limits of Big Data and AI." Uh, do you listen to me? Uh, do you hear me? Okay. 
Uh, just begin. Yes, it's perfect. And also, yes. we see your slides. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, I got it. Let's go on. Uh, this is the first component of the lecture series of the digital transformation. Uh, the title of this time is Knowledge Production in the Data Driven Society. And I am honored to have my lecture as the first one. I'd like to begin the discussion from social or economical point of view as introduced. introduced. However, mm, privacy protection intellectual property and related issues are out of scope in my presentation. There have, uh, there have still been other barriers to develop, uh, develop knowledge uh, from big data with distributed data. As a management science scholar, I'd like to discuss with economic and industrial point of view. OECD published the document titled as Debt Driven Innovation in 2015. In six years, how many success cases with knowledge development and vision, uh, emerging business models with knowledge from data have there come to be? Sensors uh, which generate data have got to be sold much cheaper. Network cost has also dropped tremendously down and uh, price of processors has also decreased. And you can see many engineers try to implement systems with Raspberry Pi or other under 100 US dollar computers. In fact, uh, there are so many sensors all around the cities, in factories, farms, and et cetera, et cetera. Data generated by distributed sensors are aggregated to clouds through cheap and fast networks. There have come to be a massive amount of data. There has come to be enough amount of data for AI to generate algorithms. How to implement AI in society has been a global issue for the past few years. World Economic Forum proposed the vision to reach the uh, sustainable development goals with artificial intelligence. But this is a picture uh, stored in my mobile phone. You, do you see? I don't remember when and what I take. This file is completely worthless. But this is a kind of digital data. What you see right now is data. Of course, uh, what's the display in front of you consists of digital data. I hope the data generated with my presentation is of value of you. But clearly, uh, some of the data uh, that is variable to you is not always variable to others. This JPEG file consists of GPS data. In other words, sorry. Uh, the data consists of geolocation information. If no value as a photograph, the data indicates where I was at the time in specific context. Sorry, mm, the data is variable. One of the nature of data is that value is very context dependent. The title of today's event is Knowledge Production in Data-Driven Society. As I mentioned, there has come to be plenty amount of data in cloud in the world. The left and important issue is how to convert the data into knowledge with value. Some of participants, including I, wear Apple Watches and other wearable devices, 
is a function of pulse oximeter. These devices can provide data such as 95%. Uh, 2021, September 23rd, uh, 10, 9, and so on. Numerical sequences around never get to be knowledge, definition, measuring unit, and others. Only with appropriate accompanying information, um, data can be utilized appropriately. Uh, Brad, Brad, okay. I will approach and blood oxygen level is continuously measured. Then if mm, I hope not to realize, I was sent to, sent to a hospital with COVID-19 infection. With the doctor, they utilize the data from approach. There is a great risk in treating data with uncontrolled methods of measurement using less accurate instruments as if they were measured by trained uh, medical personnel in a medical facility using instruments with medical grade accuracy. However, even if the data is not accurate enough, there are many situations where it is better to be, to have it than not have it. If the doctor can know the context in which the data was generated, such as model of devices and the procedure of data generation, it may be possible to utilize it to the, to the extent appropriate. Such kind of metadata enable data to be converted into knowledge. This presentation is given from Japan. So I'd like to show the famous model of knowledge management by Ikujiro Nonaka. SEK Seki model shows procedure to convert tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge. On the other hand, is digital data explicit knowledge? Data generated by sensors is result of mechanical measurement result. And you might think they are never subjective and ambiguous. Is it true? It may cost more to convert uh, tacit data to explicit knowledge than humans one. Because most of the data is unstructured, insufficient of information, and lack of interoperability, uh, even for human beings like me, but also for computers. So there must be if you want to convert mm, such kind of data, you have to make the data to be designed to be designed to be uh, designed to be better. Moreover, there have been incidents caused the bias of the algorithm that reinforce existing discrimination. Apple Card's credit line bias in 2019 is a typical example. Most of data is generated through human activities. Data generated with the result of average human behavior and influenced by prejudice and the discrimination of people. Big data means massive amount of data. Big data analysis AI-based algorithms are conducted with massive amount of data. The law of large number is one of the basic laws of statistics. However, large number of uh, large amount of data is just not enough. 
advanced knowledge is required to eliminate bias and in each procedure of data generation, data generation methods, sampling, and algorithm development. So we can't believe just a law of large numbers. Uh, we have to think about and develop institutional, institutional ways to design. Uh, the secure data for a knowledge production. This event is held online. Uh, the online event is superior to uh, uh, superior for uh, to uh, send uh, the information or send, send the information all over the world with cheap, much cheaper cost. So uh, I know uh, some of participants are from Europe and uh, very far from Japan. So I'm very happy to, to give presentation to you. However, uh, online event here is good for locals to participate. However, I hope I met you face to face. Of course, we cannot have event because of COVID-19. In Japan, more than half population is fully vaccinated today. I have already vaccinated uh, the last month. Uh, however, uh, there are many countries and regions that are hindering vaccine procurement. Uh, vaccine supply difficulties are not caused only by production and distribution limits. In some countries and regions, the lack of clinical trials on ethnic groups, which make up the majority of local residents, is also a fact. Recently, the team vaccine equity come to be mentioned frequently. I would like to propose to use the term data equity because there are some areas uh, where there are not enough human resources with knowledge and skills in data generation, analysis, and algorithm development. And the asymmetry of data generation and skilled human resources might cause cyber colonization, economy, and knowledge production including academic activities are conducted globally. Now in 21st century, we have to prevent emerging new form of colonization for sustainable development of knowledge. Today, I have discussed the barriers to combat big data to knowledge lack of common data model for recognizing context, uh, bias in data generation, sampling, and algorithm development, inequality of data and skill, uh, skilled human resources. To overcome such barriers, we have to develop an enabling environment of knowledge production in data-driven society pursuit for more exhaustive and accessible data set, introducing broadly accepted data model. Even, you, even if you have, uh, I'm sorry, even if, if you have, what kind of, uh, various kind of uh, smart devices, uh, doctor can make use of the data from the device. Then uh, introducing broadly accepted data model, exhausting data for eliminating device, controls of risks associated with data provision, global distribution of human resources for utilizing knowledge generation. So this is the end of end of slide. So thank you for your listening and thank you for your interest interested to uh, participate in this event. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.
thanks a lot, uh, Yoshiaki, um, for this presentation, which already touched upon, I think, very important issues, not only the well, technical problems of transferring data into, into knowledge, uh, but also the consequences of, uh, well, limitations in the availability of data, biases, in, and also, of course, uh, the inequality uh, with regard to the resources, the access to data and the resources to use and apply the data. I think that's a very uh, good start uh, into our discussions. Um, can you stop the screen sharing now when we go on Sorry. to the... Yes, yes. Moment. thank you. Um, so, um, okay, now we move on from, um, I think that's already uh, the question of inequality. Uh, is a little bit related um, or is maybe the link to the next presentation. Um, uh, Nadine He, who will uh, talk about the knowledge as a commons in the digital age, changing patterns of knowing and empowerment. Of course, it relates to the question of access uh, to data and uh, participation in knowledge production in the digital society. So Nadine, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and for your invitation tonight. I'm really happy to talk tonight on knowledge as a commons in the digital age, changing patterns of knowing and empowerment. So my talk today is related to my work on commons, both natural resource commons and various forms of knowledge from the perspective of a historian of global history of knowledge. But at this forum today is transdisciplinary in nature, I will present some issues, debates, and observations out of this field that are perhaps also relevant here and to a broader audience, rather than delving into concrete historical case studies. So I will first talk about how we can perceive knowledge as a commons, and then come to one particular example of empowerment and indigenous knowledge and conclude with some remarks on shifting paradigms within humanities. So let me start with the question, how did knowledge became a commons and what can we understand and define as a knowledge commons? Eleanor Astrom and Charlotte Hess dealing with knowledge as a commons from the perspective of an institutional analysis and development framework had a huge impact on this definition and within the whole field. The idea of commons was originally applied and still is mainly to material resources. In this sense, knowledge commons grew out of, of this particular scholarship and um, is very much related to the study of natural resource commons. Given this, generally speaking, scholarship differs between knowledge commons and natural resource commons in the sense that the latter are finite and knowledge is infinite insofar as we even share knowledge, it remains infinite. On the other hand, there are attempts to find an overarching definition of commons because access and sharing knowledge is defined by asymmetries and power relations, which are in a way comparable to those within the field or when it goes um, for uh, natural resources. Still most widely used is the definition of commons as defined by Ostrom and other people in this particular volume you can see here as a resort shared by a group of people that is subject to social dilemmas. The definition is up to now still useful in the sense as we increasingly encounter new types of enclosures of information and cultural resources made possible in the digital environment, but also we encounter new opportunities for online collection and collective action and knowledge sharing afforded by the very same platform and the internet. In relation to the comments in the book, the scholars defined knowledge as all useful ideas, information, and data in whatever form in which it is expressed or obtained. The idea of knowledge commons is associated with the so-called digital age and consumes access to common pool resources in the form of knowledge for the whole of humanity. In this sense, typical examples of knowledge commons are Wikipedia, 
where individually collected knowledge is shared, but also preserved and stored on a planetary level, both by individual actors and institutions. Other examples are open access software, perhaps most famously Linux, for instance. At the same time, commoning practices raise questions of political epistemologies and power relations. And it remains to define what exactly is useful knowledge. And this obviously differs among various actors and over time. There is a dilemma within society whether to share knowledge comments or not that brings within conflicting notions of ownership and property rights in academia, but also, of course, elsewhere. But while we have such examples as Wikipedia and others, there are also calls for epistemological decolonization of knowledge dominated by the global North. The call for commoning and commons actions was paralleled with such voices as part of the decolonization movement after the Second World War and critical theory in the field of the humanities in the 1990s. Universal notion of so-called Western science and the authoritarian form of knowledge were criticized as Eurocentric. Hess and Ostrom, for instance, have been criticized that they were too much focusing on applying traditional natural resource commons analysis to the theory and practice of knowledge commons. While the question of information equity, protection of indigenous and traditional knowledge commons from predatory capture or enclosure needs to be tackled and addressed much more thoroughly. In this regard, for instance, Jane Anderson's work on the growing conflicts over access and control of indigenous knowledge in libraries, archives, and museums is extremely timely. The claim remains that more research needs to be done in the area of indigenous knowledge and commons. But increasingly, there are various research projects and scholars that are tackling these issues. So for instance, the legal scholars Kira Alman and Anasuya Sengupta at Oxford University, this a call for open global rights online. But for some new forms of knowledge commoning and knowledge access are projects of empowerment, both politically and academically. In my second part, I will present one of such initiatives and projects. I focus on an example that uses new social media as a platform for commenting and preserving so-called indigenous knowledge to their own community as well as to a broader audience. An intriguing example of such a project is the transdisciplinary group of scholars got called Indigenous AI. The members of the group you can see here encompasses scholars and artists from various regions and universities, as well as ethnic backgrounds, although with a focus on Pacific and Oceanic regions. Some have a, a background in computer science, while others on ab Aboriginal storytelling and music or biological and artificial intelligence, linguistic studies, cyber technology, cultural anthropology, or history. Dr. Noelani Arista, with another name, Kanaka Maoli, is a researcher, writer, and historian, as well as associate professor of Hawaiian and American history at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. She, for instance, works on Hawaiian religious, legal, and intellectual history. Dr. Arista's current projects furthered the persistence of Hawaiian historical knowledge and Hawaiian language textual archives through multiple digital med mediums and including gaming. One of the projects some member of the group are engaged with are workshops on video games. The aim is to teach indigenous youth how to adapt stories from the community into experimental digital media, such as these video games. Their claim is, I quote, one of our goals is to encourage our youths to envision themselves in the future while drawing from their heritage. We believe this helps to promote and preserve our stories, languages, and cultures while also exposing our youths to the digital tools of today and tomorrow, unquote. Participants stress that this practice keeps the traditional legends and stories alive, but also that they finally have games that, I quote, have our own culture, unquote. On a scholarly level, this is just one of various attempts to preserve so-called indigenous knowledge 
forms as a commons, both to the children of those that are still able to tell the stories, but also create an archive of knowledge for the future that is available to scholars on a global scale. One of the crucial ideas behind this is to create indigenous knowledge, not through the lens of the West or in a neo-colonial fashion, and that this form of commons thereby differs immensely from university or, or museums collections in major European histories where production, conservation, as well as access to materialized forms of indigenous in form of artifacts such as art or books is highly in, unequal. What we see here are not only new forms of knowledge commons emerging, we also see new patterns of knowing when it comes to the technology when we access archives and data. And that only connects to the question how to write books in the humanities, but also how such forms of knowledge contribute to other forms such as scientific or technical knowledge that are often given a preference in market-based studies in policy-oriented studies. From a history of knowledge point of view, and so I'm coming some, to some sort of finalizing remarks. From a history of knowledge point of view, this is very much part of a paradigm shift in the sense Thomas Kuhn has described it. The historian of science defined paradigm shift as a fundamental change in the basic concepts and experimental practices of a scientific discipline. He restricted the use of the term to the natural sciences but the concept of a paradigm shift also has been used in numerous non-scientific contexts or to describe a profound change in a fundamental model or perception of events. While global Norse hierarchies in academia and in academic institutions such as universities are still in place, this also brings up the question whether this paradigm shift is so fundamental that it changes the institutional landscape of knowledge institutions profoundly. Some scholars, such as David Bollier, among others, advocate a post-capitalist world achieved through new ways of commoning and integration of various forms of indigenous knowledge into science. From a history of knowledge point of view, I can see a profound change in knowledge economies and epistemologies, at least in the field of humanities. So I'm closing here and I'm happy to discuss whether you also see such changes and paradigm shifts in your fields or if you think this is something you could discuss in the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, with the introduction of the internet, everybody was thinking that now we all have access to information and everybody can share information freely. Of course, that's technically possible, but I think we, we forgot that still um, personal individual attention is is limited and so in the end the internet might just be a sort of a sphere uh, created an ecosystem where knowledge of different kinds can compete with each other and the danger of course is that the dominant knowledge will sort of uh, crowd out uh, the uh, other local knowledge uh, and the question, the big question is how to preserve and how to use the technology to, to keep local or indigenous knowledge sort of alive within this new ecosystem uh, created by the internet. I think that's a very, very challenging and very important aspect. So thank you. Thank you very much. And now we have another dimension which is related to knowledge production in the digital age, and that is um, the boundary between the private and the public, which of course relates not only to social media, but also to questions of surveillance and security. And um, uh, E.T. Abraham um, will present his uh, view on this and he will also present uh, quite interesting examples where we can see these shifting boundaries. E.T., please go ahead. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Franz, and thank you to the DIJ for this invitation. Uh, I should say at the beginning that uh, this is not, um, this is very much a set of problems or thoughts that I've been having for some time. It's not a fully worked out paper by any means, uh, but it's really a chance for me to share with you some of my thinking and some of the dilemmas that I've been confronted with. 
um, as we try and make sense in a from a sort of traditional point of view of political theory or political philosophy, uh, how the digital world has changed the ways that we think of very typical and familiar concepts and ways of being. Uh, something new is called, is, is certainly happening to us, and this is an effort to try and come to terms with it. Um, and the other point I'd just like to make before we begin is that this is very much, um, I approach these questions very much sort of from the bottom up, not from the top down. Um, and so I'm going to use three different examples, uh, each occupying a different space, you might say, uh, to point to some of the problems and dilemmas that uh, I see in front of us, uh, without, of course, uh, having the confidence or the luxury of offering answers or solutions. I'm hoping that the discussion that we lead to will help us think through these things in some way, but as you'll see in a few minutes, um, it's it's not that easy. Or these are, you know, what I'm really trying to point to is some of the complications that emerge uh, from very familiar ideas. And in, in this case, the, the words public and private are key to what I'm trying to say. Okay, let me share my screen. And if someone could uh, confirm that uh, it's looking okay, because I'm somehow always managed to have this problem. Um, let me see, uh, Franz, can you confirm that you can see the... Sorry, yes, sure, perfect. It's, yes. Okay, it's not the yes. double screen, it's a single one. No, right? no, no, it's, uh, it's a perfect, yeah. Okay, all right, so um, let, let me get started. The outline of what I'm going to present, and here I'm just referring back to my title of the many words in the title, digital worlds and so on, it's the reshaping that I'm really trying to focus on today. So the outline of what I want to present uh, is what I'm going to walk through in the next 20 minutes or so, uh, three spaces of digital transformation. So three examples or case studies, one from the city, one from the border, one from the international, three very different kinds of locations or sites. Uh, and then I want to consider the datification of society through three words that again are very, are very commonplace uh, and yet have acquired a meaning I think that has transformed them compared to what we usually think of these meanings, convenience, security, and sovereignty. Uh, and finally, I want to end with a set of questions. Um, I put the word innovation in quotes to show my skepticism, you might say, about uh, whether everything that gets called innovation in Silicon Valley really deserves that title or not. Uh, and you will see in the cases that I'm trying to bring up that, you know, the question of innovation, especially in the first case, in the city case, uh, is, uh, it is there, there's no question about it, but um, at what cost or what exactly is being innovated uh, is really the issue. And I think you'll see a resonance also with the, uh, with the question of the commons and Nadine's presentation when we talk about my first case, which is going to be as follows. All right, so let me begin with a clipping from the Jakarta Post, the English newspaper of uh, Indonesia uh, from 2015. I'm sorry, it's a little bit small, but I hope you can see it, uh, in which um, there was a, uh, just 2015, so just uh, six, uh, six years ago, five years ago, uh, there was a bit of a scandal because um, the well-known and very popular uh, rights hailing service called Gojek was banned for a day by the transportation minister because according to Indonesian law, two-wheelers, motorcycles, scooters are not allowed to be used as means of public transport. And the day after this happened, uh, the president of the country, Joko Widodo, said, no, this must be lifted immediately and we must go back to the way that things were. Now, this is a remarkable story, both in because it's a very recent story, it happened just five or five, six years ago, and because the company in question, Gojek, uh, has become Indonesia's greatest success story when it comes to becoming to internet companies, uh, because it has been so phenomenally successful as it's penetrated into such, into almost all aspects of everyday urban life, uh, in most of the big cities of the country, right? So what is Gojek? Um, oh, by the way, I should say my note says un Indonesia's first unicorn, but actually it's the Decacorn, meaning it's reached $10 billion in valuation. 
while at the same time, as is often the case, has yet to make a profit, or at least from 2020 had yet to make a profit. So somehow that combination of enormous value and no profit seems to be something that we've now gotten used to when it comes to Silicon Valley. Uh, I think it's careful, we should be careful not to get too used to it too quickly uh, and just have a little bit of common sense about what this really means. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. What does Gojek do? Well, Indonesia has terrible, Indonesian cities like Jakarta have terrible traffic, as I'm sure some of you know. And so over time, a kind of an organic response to the, to the absolute massive traffic jams or machet as they're called, um, were these little motorcycles that would weave their way through traffic and essentially use their, both the skills of the motorcyclist and the small space taken up by the motorcycle to give commuters a way of getting home uh, and bypassing the traffic or at least not being stuck in traffic the way that somebody in a car or in a bus or in a, in a truck of some kind would be. So it was an organic response, which was called OJEC. The motorcycle taxi was called OJEC. Uh, and it had been in place for many, many years. So what did Gojek actually do? Well, Gojek took this organic phenomenon, which had emerged in the city quite spontaneously as a result in response to a particular need and centralized it. It digitized it. It took something that was so-called public in the sense that it was part of the public space of the city and privatized it. Now, the cleverness of what they were able to do was, able, what was their ability to take away the negotiation that had not been very much a part of the process of hiring one of these motorcycle taxis and putting that on an app where in a sense the, 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 the inconvenience of having to negotiate, having to argue, having to discuss was taken away and was made something that became mechanized or was put into the form of a smartphone or something else. That was a huge convenience, it's no question. Uh, but at the end of the day, what they also were able to do, and this is the point about labor deprecaritization, is that the people who were actually riding these motorcycles, driving these motorcycles, were often migrants from different parts of the country, trying to make a living in the city. Uh, and now, for the first time, as a result of becoming part of the Gojek, uh, urban, uh, sorry, corporate phenomenon, their uh, labor process was recognized and given more credit and, and actually given more return than they had before. So I'm not trying to dismiss them completely as not being a value, but I'm trying to negotiate or identify what exactly that value was. Now the process of the outcome that we might be, uh, that we see, uh, which I think is also worth mentioning, is that the meaning of the city has also been transformed as a result. If at one point a city was defined in an administrative sense, or in the sense of not being uh, the rural, the countryside. Now we can actually argue that the city has become that space where Gojek, the app for Gojek works. In other words, if you, can if you can identify the location that you want to travel to on your Gojek map, and Gojek will find somebody to take you there, that in fact has started to define what the city is. Now, I have to mention that this work is being done by a PhD student of mine, Onat Kibaroglu from Turkey. Uh, and it's his work that I'm presenting here. Uh, somebody's microphone seems to be on, but that's fine. Um, and so the first thing I want to point to is the Gojek phenomenon, uh, which is uh, both penetrated into everyday spheres of everyone's life, has centralized something that was public and made it private and derived huge amounts of revenue from it, if, as mentioned before, very little profit. Second example. Um, now, for those of you who are listening from Europe, I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of Frontex, uh, which is the border agency for the European Union, uh, and in a sense controls the borders, protects the borders, keeps Europe safe uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, again, a couple of examples, uh, little news stories that I want to point to as a way of initiating this conversation. Uh, one, of the, one of the important factors about Frontex is that it works very closely with a variety of private companies consultancies, global consultancies like Deloitte, uh, and Deloitte is very much in the process of helping the governments of Europe uh, realize what a smart border is, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, Frontex, of course, has also been in the forefront of using new technologies, digital technologies, biometrics, and other forms of, um, um, shall we say, measuring people uh, as a way of including, of improving the, the security of, of the country. So let's get into a little more detail. 
Now here, I'm drawing on the work of uh, um, a legal scholar at Edinburgh, uh, Dimitri van den Mierske. I'm saying that terribly, and, and my apologies. Uh, and my focus in this case, the other space, the second space I want to talk about is the border. Now, Europe, as we know, has shifted the idea of borders. If you think of how Europe's borders have been defined over the last few decades, we've seen a very clear, uh, not just the expansion of the idea of Europe to include Eastern Europe and so on, but I'm thinking more in terms of how the border was defined from a physical border, which in some cases would have had a material substance of some kind, a wall, a fence, uh, or something even more, um, more, more dangerous, uh, to the extended border. And here I'm thinking, for example, about trying to discourage migrants from uh, crossing the Mediterranean to arrive in Europe, and hence effectively pushing the border of Europe out into North Africa, to today's concern, which is what we're going to call virtual borders. Now, virtual borders is, the, if you want to say, the latest iteration of the, the idea of uh, the frontier with technology. Uh, and it's very much being developed through private-public partnerships. And the two best-known companies that have been given the contracts to do some of this work are iBorder Control and Trespass, which some of you may have encountered if you cross borders into Europe um, uh, in, 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 recent, uh, in recent years. Now, what does iBorder Control seek to do? Well, they are hoping to use artificial intelligence, particularly machine learning, to combine a variety of data from different databases, social media, credit card use, travel behavior, and actually much more, into actionable information by which they mean, they mean uh, a decision tree is produced, which allows a, um, an agent, immigration agent on the border to decide whether to include somebody uh, into, the, into Europe or not. Now, this, of course, has always been the job of these agents, and they have relied on a variety of tacit knowledge, uh, as well as experience, as well as other sorts of restrictions in order to decide whether to let somebody in or out. And we know that there are all the varieties of different kinds of controls that they apply. But what's different now is when we start using machine learning in order to do this, is that the process by which a decision of yes or no is produced is no longer visible to us, no longer available to us in a form that we would consider traditionally. I'm gonna go back to the previous slide for a second to, I'd like to go, but it's decided not to go. Whoops, okay, yeah, here we go. Um, to look at the quotation at the, end, at the top of that slide, which says that, quote, Kelly, Keely Crockett from iBorder, I cannot explain what 100 neural networks are doing and how they are interlaced together. We're talking about 4,900 rules from the final risk classifier alone. You can't explain it. In other words, in order to produce security, in order to produce safety, we allow a machine, which of course does have certain rules and certain conditions built into it, to learn how to decide what may be a dangerous person and what may not. The amount of abuse that this can lead to is, I think, fairly obvious to all of us. So I'm not going to belabor that point. But what, of course, is concerning for everybody is that here is an example of private data from a variety of different sources being integrated or synthesized through an obscure, meaning a black box, which is a machine learning AI system, in order to come out with a decision that is publicly justified uh, in relation to this particular individual. So the outcome here, um, I've, I've tried to be a little bit funny, you might say, by saying joining the inscrutable, meaning we don't know how it's actually taking place, with the executable, yes, no, in the name of territorial security. Now, I think, and this is a different conversation to take place, but those of you who are interested in border studies, I'm sure are familiar with the, with the study called Border as Method, uh, which was produced a couple of years ago by Sandra, uh, Sandro Mizadra, uh, and um, his colleague from Australia, whose name I'm blanking on for a second. Uh, and what they really point to, or what is re really worth taking away from this conversation is that even as the border is always positioned as a site to say, we are keeping the threat from outside at bay. We are in a sense drawing a line between safety and insecurity. What is always at stake is the idea of Europe itself. The object that's being preserved, the object that's being secured, uh, is always, in fact, uh, under a cloud of anxiety 
or under um, is always very much in question. Uh, and the, the extent to which the border has become something that defines the line between Europe, the West and the rest is of course a familiar phrase that you've all heard. Uh, it really is always about speaking inwards rather than looking out. So it redefines Europe to say that the threat is always from outside rather than inside. Uh, and we know that's a complicated statement to make given today's politics of Europe and also defines moving bodies as the source of risk rather than those who are quote unquote already present or within the country, within the region. Okay, moving on to my third space. I hope I still have time. Yeah, perfect, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Franz. Um, I'm going to turn now to a different example and a different space. This one is going to be the space of the international. And I'm going to look at uh, a series of discussions and debates that took place around the question of sharing of scientific materials in relation to global pandemics. Three uh, little clips from different locations. One, one is the, uh, which you can see is when Indonesia refuses to share bird flu samples with the World Health Organizations. Uh, this is in the um, 2007 when there was a big um, bird flu uh, panic in Southeast Asia. Um, more recently, of course, we're very familiar with the stories about China and how much they have been a problem or not being helpful in terms of uh, pandemic um, control by telling, uh, uh, telling the world exactly what may have happened or not happened in Wuhan. But this is, of course, an older story going back some years where uh, samples of a dangerous flu virus were kept away from the World Health Organization. And there's more to say here, so I'm just giving you the, just flagging what these stories are about. Uh, and then I want to turn to the third piece, which is the one um, on top, which is uh, from the New York Times as well. But here it describes the repository, the archive, where these uh, influenza databases are held. They're held at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, which some of you will know is a place where nuclear weapons were designed. Uh, and more important is the sentence that follows that in the one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph, which says, access requires a password and is limited to about 15 research groups, mostly governments and academics and WHO, World Health Organization's Global Flu Surveillance Network. So what we have are two countries that are being uh, that are being castigated or being stigmatized for not sharing their samples. And then we realize that samples are not in fact globally available, but rather they're kept in a sequence database at Los Alamos and only some groups and some research entities are given access to it. So there's a little more, it's a complicated story, which I'll unpack for you uh, a little bit in the next few minutes. If I can get the slide to move here. Yeah. Okay. So the third space, uh, which I'm calling international, and I'm dry, drawing here on the work of Lyle, my colleague at the Singapore University of Technology and Development, Lyle Fernley, who has been writing about this in an absolutely wonderful way. And I you know, recommend his work to all of you. In fact, I recommend all these young scholars work to all of you. Um, and uh, what he is trying to point to is this, one of the many myths about science is uh, the myths and practices, you might say, is that, of course, it's very much built as a transnational phenomenon, um, even as occasionally we see efforts at producing national science. In fact, scientists themselves consider themselves to be, or most of them do, part of a transnational community, which used to be called Invisible College at one point, a long time ago. Uh, and collaboration between groups around the world is normal. Um, samples are sent, uh, data is sent, individuals are sent, for, you know, the exchange that takes place at the global level between scientific labs around the world has been taking place for decades. Now, of course, like all forms of exchange, it's not an equal exchange, there's an unequal exchange, and I don't have to, again, go on into great detail about what the contours of that inequality are, they should be pretty obvious to you. But what that really points to is an important distinction that needs to be made between what's global, yes, exchange is taking place at a global level, and the international conditions that sometimes prevent or sometimes hinder or sometimes ad advance and sometimes make easier this exchange and this transmission of ideas, of samples, of knowledge, of people, and so on. Okay, so I'm drawing a, a line there between the global and the international, 
one in the sense of, you know applying a standard which is equal for everybody the other one in fact being more realistic perhaps and saying that well in fact there are some lines some conditions some some barriers to this free flow of information which in the ideal world is meant to work how science is meant to work now in the previous slide what i was showing you was um, the question of physical samples being sent across borders to be shared with other research groups and to be kept in certain depositories, uh, which are mostly held in the global north. Now, it turns out that nowadays, the question of physical samples is less important than it used to be because the sample itself can be digitized and the digital information can be shared with groups much more simply and much more easily, as we heard also in the first presentation, uh, and quite effectively uh, with people all around the world. And what we find is that digital samples are good enough in most cases, not all, uh, for surveillance to find out you know, what the state of a particular uh, flu virus is, to build test kits and to build vaccines. And in fact, the mRNA vaccines that we are all familiar with now, uh, built in German laboratories, um, having, were in fact built, were the initial, the first, first round, you might say, of those uh, vaccines was built on digital sample, not the physical thing at all. So it's clear that those are very effective and, and very useful. The problem comes when we realize that the question of freedom of information and exchange is not something that is, in fact, equal across the board. So even as China did not allow that physical sample to travel, even as Indonesia did not allow that physical sample to be shared, they uploaded the digital data, which comprised, uh, which is in, extracted from this sample to a global uh, database at once. Now, in the world of science, there are these WHO laboratories and WHO um, um, archives, uh, which many, but not all labs get access to. And there's an alternative system, which was built initially by, um, by a scientist from, from Italy, who did not want uh, her work to go into a closed um, in a circle where only some people could get access to it. And she found that in order to make it possible for anyone who wanted to use it, not only did she have to create a parallel system to the WHO system, but she also had to set up a new set of rules about what it meant to use this data, the obligations of any lab that developed new research from this work, uh, and uh, the credit and the, um, and the recognition of those who had done the early work of uploading had to be given its due credit. In other words, if you were, uh, uh, shall we say, a less than scrupulous, sci scrupulous scientist, uh, you were being discouraged from just using that data, writing your own papers, without uh, acknowledging that the data that you are using came from somewhere else, who had done it, who had done it first, and that you were building on the work of somebody else. Now, most scientists will do that anyway, but not all. And so um, what is more disappointing is the need that it was that she found that in order to make the equation of data public, in order to take this, is it private? I'm not sure, but in order to take this nationally produced information and make it available to anyone in the world to do their work with, it was important, it was necessary to go outside the existing multilateral system that states have built to share with each other, the, world, the United Nations Organization, and in this case, the World Health Organization, to create a parallel system uh, which would actually do this job far more effectively. So the term that was initially used to describe Indonesia and China not sharing their samples was viral sovereignty, the phrase that you see um, uh, in the slide. Um, and the questions that it raises are, of course, who owns the samples, who controls the database, and of course, who makes and profits from vaccines. So this is a story which, in a sense, shuttles between sovereignty or control and ownership and sharing. So you've got a norm of global science, which is to share information with each other, much in the way that we are sharing our knowledge and information with the group of people who are listening to us. Uh, and a sovereign idea of sovereignty, which is that the idea that a particular sample or a particular product or a particular idea comes from a certain place and comes with a certain set of ownership rights, uh, which prevents others from accessing them completely or without paying a certain kind of uh, premium or a rent of some kind in order to access this. So both are true at the same time. Um, oddly enough, or surprisingly for some, 
uh, the question of um, national control has come up in tension against this idea of global sharing. And that's the story that I want to point to here. And again, what I'm trying to get at here is these ideas of public and private now are so much more difficult to pin down when we have these real world examples of what it actually means in practice. So to summarize what I've tried to say so far, we started with the idea of the space of the city. We're thinking about privatization and how a corporation comes along and privatizes something that's part of an organic social process and centralizes it through digital technologies, uh, offering convenience, and I'm putting it in quotes because it always comes with strings attached, offering convenience to users, taking some of the more irritating aspects of those engagements away from, uh, from them. So there's a genuine benefit, allowing those who labor in these activities to acquire more security than they had before, but at the same time, making sure that they acquire a hefty, uh, take a hefty revenue from these activities uh, in order to offer these conveniences to a global public. Now, what a point I'm trying to make here is that if Gojek didn't exist, OJEC would still be working. There would still be the means by which people had used these motorcycle taxis in the past. They look different now, they are different now. An entirely new structure has been created over and above incorporating what was once public into something that is now private, but with a public face. The second example I wanted to point to is that of the border, where uh, private data of anyone who wants to enter the country is now being entered into a black box through this machine learning AI system uh, owned by a private company who have themselves acknowledge that they don't know exactly what's happening, but they promise that they will be able to provide you with a single answer to the question, is this a dangerous man or is this a dangerous woman or not? And that is justified or that is leveraged under the larger umbrella term of security. So that security, what is that security of whom and how and for, for what uh, remains, of course, a much more complicated question to answer. But what I'm trying to get at here is, again, this tension between public and private being manifested in a very different order uh, in this example. When we move to the state of the, the, the space of the international, I'm interested in exploring or what I was trying to point to are the tensions between sovereign ownership. What does it mean to own a virus that's been produced in a certain place, uh, which may have been created through the interaction of multiple uh, living objects, including animals, before it ends up on a human, in a human host. Um, scientific recognition, the first person or the first group or the first lab that's actually uh, been able to produce this virus in the digital form or extract the virus from its uh, host in some way. And the control, the international regulatory controls that show the limits of scientific cooperation. So the tension between sovereignty and sharing. And here, we, the notion of public has shifted once more from sovereignty to sharing, uh, while at the same time recognizing that private actors of a variety of different kinds, especially drug companies, may benefit hugely from this work. I'm almost done. Um, let me just share with you. I often, I've started doing this more and more often now. When I see a certain keyword recurring in my, in my work, something that I'm writing about, um, I plug it into Ngram, which is something that uh, is one of the Google functions that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, um, just to see what the usage of the word over time uh, offers us. And again, I'm not trying to suggest this is reliable scientific data of any kind. It's limited by language. It's only using English. It's limited by time. It's only looking at the last hundred words uh, and it's only looking at books. So it's a very, very narrow and very, very uh, incomplete form of data gathering. But I just felt it's useful sometimes to look at these things to see what they might tell us. The trend that I can point to, I think right away here is that privacy as an idea or as a concept, as a term has been increasing in attention. People are using it more and more uh, ever since the 1960s, but particularly since the 1970s, um, with a peak being reached around 20, uh, around 2000. Um, and so that we see a trend going upwards for some time now, whereas private, which is not exactly the same as privacy, uh, has more or less stayed the same for a long time, but has started going down in 2000, as if to say, we've given up the idea of the private, 
once the digital revolution began. Even as our concerns about privacy might have risen in recent years, uh, we have decided that there's no point holding on to the private, it's been taken away from us. Now, like I said, I don't want to take that, uh, those diagrams too seriously, but I think it's sometimes useful just to point out to see how language uh, reflects some of the larger trends that are underway in society. Okay, my last slide, and here I'm going to, I'm going to really just ask a series of questions rather than answers. Uh, we used to think of the private as marking the limit of state reach. So this is a very liberal idea, of course, uh, the idea that the state's control over your body stops at the edge of your house or your, you know, whatever you define as your private space. And it really means the right to be left alone, right? That's the oldest and the most simple idea of, um, of privacy in a liberal universe. Um, and here, just to put it in context, uh, the state also has its own notion of privacy, which it calls secrecy. And it's been a constant struggle between civil society and the state in order to open up that question of secrecy through various forms of um, uh, uh, legislation, really to say that you know, transparency and uh, information has to be made available to the public in order for the state to continue to be legitimate. Um, we find, of course, and this is an absolutely distinctive feature of the digital revolution, that the notion of privacy has gone out the window. I think there's no question about that. It's been breached. Now, in the past, we would have always assumed that the evildoer, in this case, was the state. The state has taken our privacy away, only to find that what we do now is that we give it away ourselves to these companies and to others, sometimes willingly, sometimes not. But we give it away rather than have it taken away. Of course, it is also taken away in certain cases. And to that given away and taken away, we must also add the word colonized, by which I mean it is appropriated uh, with or without our knowledge. Um, sometimes our ideas of privacy and what uh, corporations think of as useful information about the person, which of course should be private, um, is something that they can get access to because they've made us give it away in one form or the other. So the actors involved in terms of privacy, the loss of privacy, uh, both ourselves, as well as governments, as well as corporations, as well as scientific labs, hackers, and others. And that others covers a lot of ground, as you probably know. So how do we think of the private then today? Is it something that's still ours? Or should we see it as a kind of a neoliberal universe, as something that's valuable? Should we see it in more political terms? The private is political. Uh, should we see it as a secret? Um, who does it belong to? Should we take it back? How do we take it back? Do we even know who accesses it, who controls it? How do we regulate what it can be used for? There's been uh, uh, suggestions that we should be allowed to become digitally invisible. And I think the Europeans are in the lead in terms of thinking in, on, those, on those lines. And I'm, I'm very pleased to see that. How do we build an amnesia though in a way that is actually meaningful and effective? And is that always the answer to the questions or the problems that we face? So I'm, only, I'm going to end on a very somber and humble note, really, by saying that we really have a number of questions before us today. And the basic question is, what does the loss of privacy mean in the digital age? I'm not even arguing that we have something called privacy anymore, but we have a loss of it, that's for sure. Uh, what harms or wrongs do we need protection from? So it's not just a question of retaining something called privacy the actions that are done against us using our private knowledge, using our privacy, using ourselves uh, are often harmful. And I think there's many examples we can draw from social media to prove this very, very clearly, not even to go to Frontex and the whole border control business. Um, and our digital selves, uh, which have not yet received uh, completely, shall we say, legal standing, uh, do those legal, do those digital selves require different kinds of privacy, privacy protections than the kinds that we will associate with the physical body that we have, that we're sitting in and talking from today? Um, all I can say is that the protections that should be available or acquired by digital selves should not be less than the protections offered other entities, particularly private corporations. So at that point, let me stop and thank you again for giving me this chance to share my work. Thank you. Oh yeah, thanks a lot. And I would like to invite the other two speakers also to switch on their uh, videos, their camera. Um, and I also encourage uh, the audience uh, to pose questions in the chat, which we're gonna use later on. Of course, later on, you'll also have the opportunity to 
raise your hand and, and uh, ask your questions uh, directly in person. I mean, that's the advantage of having you all here online. So a uh, quite a diverse perspective, uh, but I think there are, um, there are quite a few similar, uh, of course, similarities because we talk about uh, digital uh, digitalization, we talk about data, uh, big data. And um, so I would like to, um, yeah, first of all, give you um, the possibility to react uh, to each other. How do the other presentations maybe relate to your, uh, to your topic? And um, I would, uh, yeah, maybe we can, we start in the, in the same uh, sequence. Um, Yoshiaki, any, any reaction from your side uh, to uh, the co-presenters? I'm very interested to both of presentation, especially in the, uh, the, the changes uh, caused by the data and in communication and, uh, and the feelings of uh, the sp or space or territory and, and in communication. So especially it is, uh, especially in it is for a presentation uh, that uh, the changes in a territory, you know, what changes category uh, caused by data is very, very, uh, very, very similar. That uh, my, in my presentation, uh, the context, uh, the contextual data defines the value of data. Uh, but the, uh, the context changes, uh, the con context is developed by data and contextual data defines the situation or status of, of uh, individuals. So this is very same and and there are both sides of coin. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, um... I mean, there are lots, uh, I mean, the, the, the three examples, I think, um, uh, showed us a lot about um, how, how data um, sort of change our, uh, maybe also not only space, they transform space, maybe the first example, but also the other, of course, uh, the, the question of um, where is the private space? Where do we have our privacy um, in, uh, in this new digitalized, uh, world. Um, Nadine, your, um, maybe your take on Yoshiaki's presentation and Iti's presentation? Yes, thanks so much. So I think, I mean, as I am perhaps a little bit from a different field, but I found very interesting is to think together space and, and sort of the virtual space and the territory in it, its physicality. So I actually wondered, I mean, as a historian, I, I, I was like, why do we talk about public and private? As this is in a sense, a rather new sort of, rather new terms, and it's also in a way very Western sort of dichotomy. So in that sense, I wondered, isn't it also about much more? if we talk about these various layers of physicality and territory, sovereignty that we have to consider when it comes to this interplay of, of various layers of space, but also then individual bodies and the materiality. So this was just more, a, let's say, methodological thing um, I was thinking actually. So what is the, what is the sort of, analytical tools we can use as scholars to really grasp what happens. And in a way, I mean, my, my own example was a counter example in the sense that it also showed, even if it's perhaps a niche, that in certain cases, it's an empowerment and it leads to what you could call maybe not publicity, but some sort of voice whether you otherwise would be digital or otherwise invisible, but this is sort of beyond the binary of public and privacy and maybe also beyond what you would call freedom 
which is a, a term that would come up in this context, at least in Germany, all, or, yeah, all the time in these discussions. So these are more sort of this methodological issues I, I reflected on. Thanks. Um, what I see is a very interesting uh, point of intersection between all our presentations, I think, is how um, is the word, I'm now thinking back to when Nadine showed us her first definition, uh, drawing on Eleanor Ostrom and so on, I was struck by the word useful as being one of the definitions of what knowledge is. Now, that's a very old fashioned way of seeing it. And I think it's a very contestable way of seeing it. I don't think um, she would define it that way today. And I think that we've seen in a sense that the, what useful is, is a very relative term. And I think that the link between utility or usefulness and value has actually been at the heart of this digital revolution. And it's taken us a long time to catch up to the ways in which value has been generated by useless information. So we didn't know how much of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in terms of our interactions with people, our consumption behavior, the clothes that we wear, the TV shows we watch, uh, all of those things which we just thought was part of being in the world today, uh, and it's quote unquote useless information, uh, actually had value to somebody else, one, it, once it could be generalized to the level of a society or produced as metadata of some kind. So value and utility in a sense, I think have had a kind of a complicated relationship with each other forever, going back to Marx. Um, but I think that uh, what we're trying to see today is a relationship between the two, which both makes the idea of what is useful and not useful, less useful, <laughs> for us, I think, than it used to be. Uh, and it's producing value out of something that most people did not think of as valuable in itself. So yeah, as you, I'm sure you know, the, um, in a classical economics program, you know, we think of the factors, of, um, the three factors that produce value or anything, uh, land, labor, capital, right? Now, of course, it's commonplace now to hear data being added as the fourth factor of production. That's, the, that's a, a, an, an important relationship there. So, the relationship between that data that's produced and knowledge on the one hand, which I seems to me a far higher threshold we have to reach and value on the other has been undone, has been unpacked, has been given new shape by these digital corporations and the way that they behave. And this is where I think it's very important to come back to what seems to be an annoying feature of most of these big digital companies that very few of them make a profit, right? So. In the, in the conventional world of neoclassical economics, uh, it's all very well to say what you, how great your product is, but at the end of the day, someone is going to say that, well, you actually haven't produced anything of value because your shareholders are going home with empty pockets. But what happens here is that SoftBank comes along and gives Gojek another $5 billion because they haven't made a profit for the last 15 years. So you know those logics now are what we consider normal, right? And so again, all I'm trying to reiterate is that relationship between value and utility in this digital intersection with our material world uh, is a place, I think, where I'm still struggling to figure it out. Well, I think we as, as social scientists or political scientists would be happy to have a lot of data to analyze how people inter interact and to better understand, um, maybe not for the purpose to make a profit or to, to control, uh, but just to satisfy our curiosity. Um, but this, uh, obviously, we we don't get the data. No? So that's also, I mean, this is, I mean, we think of, we're talking about knowledge production. And of course, most of the knowledge production in the digital age is not actually happening at, at the classical research um, institutions in universities. It's happening where sort of uh, people expect it to produce some kind of value uh, or profit. Um, I would also like to, to maybe bring in one aspect that um, Yoshiaki mentioned, um, the idea of this inequality um, uh, problem, uh, the problem that, that there will be more dominance. I think it's uh, Yoshiaki and, and Nadine's uh, presentations are uh, somehow uh, approaching the thing from different uh, perspectives, because Nadine sees the possibility for sort of 
uh, undoing some kind of inequality, um, uh, sort of breaking the dominance of, of Western knowledge, whereas um, Yoshiaki was pointing to the risk of increasing inequality. But Yoshiaki, you also mentioned at the end, uh, you said that um, uh, we need an enabling environment for uh, knowledge production in the digital um, age. And maybe, I don't know, maybe this is something uh, that Nadine was pointing at, some kind of, uh, how can you enable, how can you create such an enabling environment? Um, I don't know whether I'm, I'm pointing at the right uh, sort of connections, but Nadine, maybe you could say a little bit more how your research maybe could contribute to this idea of enabling environment um, in terms of uh, knowledge production. Mm, I think uh, business, business logics helps uh, the decrease, decrease of inequality because uh, the, uh, to develop uh, to develop variable database, uh, especially big data uh, database, it's uh, the, uh, the based on the, uh, the scalability. So, uh, so the more the more the more data and the more uh, specialist or skilled worker to uh, to to handle data, uh, the the more value uh, generated from the data. So uh, I think uh, I think the the business activities uh, naturally seek to uh, develop. Um, develop chances to generate data uh, and uh, and raise the skill worker so uh, so so uh, so public sector have to uh, have to uh, help and encourage uh, business business industry uh, industry uh, to uh, industry to such such kind of activities but at the same time uh, they have to educate and regulate uh, to eliminate bias at that at same at the same time. So I think the I think I think it is a very uh, the balance of regulation and the the uh, utilizing economical mechanism is very 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 important. But here this data issue, of course, is if you if you uh, the incentive by private business to collect data. Um, uh, is uh, is of course given because they expect to make profit out of these data. But now, if you at the same time, um, and there are enormous, of course, economies of of scale in in doing so. So uh, on the other hand, if you want to, if you just leave it in the private sphere, then you run the risk of having sort of dominant platform players who have the access to the data, who generate the data, and who use the data. So that that's, that increases the I would say the the inequality in the system. So if you counter that and say we make the data open and public, then of course you undo the incentives maybe <laughs> for those but companies. Nothing. And, and uh, how do you balance? How do you balance this? Yeah. So but not just but just open is not enough. Uh, the every data, of course, uh, almost all data uh, is generated with the platform or uh, systems designed by uh, private companies, and and each companies, each businesses has have has their own intention and has own uh, interest. So. Uh, as as a presentation of as a two, uh, the most of the data is designed in designed with intention and, and they must be biased. And so uh, not only for uh, so so data solubility and and privacy protection is very is in, um, is is um, is important and more and additionally. Uh, we have to check the design of uh, user interface or APIs and as a uh, as a structure of data data generating. Okay, so there are additional issues there as well, uh, Nadine. So how how do you think your your uh, idea of empowerment can can contribute to this? 
sort of enabling environment. Yes, thanks. Well, I mean, I was thinking, I think I was talking on sort of different levels. So because this was about humanities, first of all, and then contributing to some sort of a debate within the humanities, which is quite a different thing than talking about big data generation in the, in the, the world of business. So I think it's perhaps a bit difficult to, to compare these two examples in that sense. But, but I think it's interesting to, to look at is that there are, in a sense, parallels that you have, from what I know, um, also in knowledge economies, as I would name them in the, in the private sector, is that this, there is always this sort of, um, as Itty put it, this ambivalence. So on, one, on the one hand, there, there needs to be a painting and participation that is sort of not always unequal, but on the other hand, then of course, there's this regulatory body, body how to regulate knowledge production, right? So, and, and what I see also in, in terms of historic transformation is that this is not a linear process as some of the political scientists usually see. So I would say that we, it's too easy to say that we just have some sort of digital revolution and then that's just an ongoing process and, and it's becoming more in unequal or less unequal, but to really look more at, at the settings of particular sectors and, and localities or spaces, as it did it put it. As I, I think there are some spaces where there are these enabling um, sort of environments and others certainly not. It's too easy to just say, well, we have it for, for the international space. Yeah, thank you. But I was I was thinking of, for example, from I mean this Hawaiian group. Um, of course, they have the technology, probably the knowledge, and and they can collect the data and they can put it sort of make it accessible, upload. They can use it among themselves. That shares probably their identity, um, helps sort of preserve the knowledge within the group. But the question is. Um, even if it's there, if it's produced, will it be used? Will it be, uh, will it be noticed? Will people take uh, note, no, note of it? I mean, that's sort of the, uh, you, you sort of uh, sketch the supply side and the question is, <laughs> is there, the, where's the demand side? Are the people distracted by all the other entertainment that is out there? Um, uh, how can these people sort of keep this knowledge within, sort of in the in the in the ecosystem uh, that it's not forgotten? It might be produced, but you might still get forgotten. Uh, this this aspect of attention um, is, I think, also very very vital. Mm. Yeah, I think. Yeah, may, if I may respond to that, sure. And but I, what I see on a on a um, international level recently, I mean, there are. This is just one example, and of course, then the question of what is useful to whom is is a is a big one. <laughs> Maybe that's another one. But um, what I see in in humanities is that there are a lot of initiatives like this, and they cannot really. Then it's not just the niche anymore. But I mean, Black Lives Matter and many other sort of politically motivated movements sort of continuously also arrive at an institutional level of knowledge production, I would say. And even if it's just one drop, then there's a growing number of, of scholars, at least, I would say that find this some sort of useful knowledge for their own sort of community. And this sort of commoning community grows. But of course, this is, is, is just spots here and there. And the question really remains whether this is more than just one short movement or or if it's mm -hmm. sustaining and becomes useful to a broader mm -hmm. sort of group yeah well thank you um harald appeared harald, I, ah, I see yes okay i have something um, to add um in yes. this regard <laughs> um shielding the humanities from the social sciences and so on is kind of um 
easy because, or rather the decolonial aspect, if you say um, that you don't want to use the data, give over the data for the general, to the general platforms, feed them into the general economy, then you're uh, resisting in a sense. And the, before that we used we and they, why don't the Hawaiians um, give the data over? Why don't they convert it into the format so that it can be used in general? This is um, a point of resistance, you, Nadine, what you said, decolonial and humanities reflect on this. And um, yes, there's, we come to the complex of causality. Do people want to resist or not? And this is actually what um, data free flow with trust Japanese initiative is kind of touching on. Um, this was an initiative to um, make the flow of data between countries easier, a G20 initiative. And most of the global North countries signed on including then also China and Global North, but they also signed on. But Indonesia and India said, no, our data is ours. We're not ready. We have to um, make legal frameworks as we want it. And then after this kind of join the international market. And these strategies are acts of resistance in a sense that now come to the forefront of data governance internationally. I think perhaps Iti can say something to that. Uh, I think you've pointed to uh, an important legacy factor here, which I, I'm used to thinking about in relation to biosovereignty. And by that I'm referring to the way, for example, in which natural resources extracted from parts of Indonesia or parts of India were then taken away from there and uh, converted into very valuable commercial products uh, by corporations and by drug companies and so on years later, right? So um, the question, I think the sensitivities of those governments uh, to the question of data is simply an extension of what they've already been thinking about is their biosphere as being an incredibly valuable natural resource that others have been exploiting for a long time. Now, you know, both governments have their flaws, it's very clear. But I think that, you know, if you see it in those terms, then data is just another resource that has been, has ap appeared out of nowhere, which has the same sort of rules have to be applied to. But I don't think it is. And I think that that's precisely the point at which, probably not me, because I don't know enough, but somebody needs to go in there and, to, and start sorting out actually the difference between what is, uh, uh, a natural product, a biological product of some kind that has commercial value and uh, data as a source of value in a different context uh, and, try and, and try and say what is common and what isn't common about them. I mean, in that sense, you know, legal mechanisms take a long time to change. And I think that it's one of the things to be very attentive to is where lawyers draw their insight from. What are they saying, you know, when they describe this digital person, when they describe this data sample, when they think of this uh, bio, you know, bioinformatics uh, vaccine, um, you know, what are they thinking about its compare? What wh what body of law are they drawing on in order to make these comparisons and connections, right? And there could be some mistakes there. There could be some new thoughts that have to be developed. Uh, and I think you know, it's, it's it's hard to say this in general. You have to be quite specific and say, okay, what are we talking about? Uh, but I think that uh, the law is catching up, right? Um, and basically, one of the reasons I was trying to use this word privacy is that it's built into so many legal doctrines around the world, right, whether European and non-European, uh, as a kind of a demarcating line, a boundary between the personal and the public. And uh, it's been so messed up, it seems to me, in this digital world that I'm quite ready to get rid of the word, but without giving up the idea of what it's trying to protect or preserve. So... I thank think you. you raised an important point. Uh, uh, thank you. We have a, um, a question in, in the chat by Florian Pukatova, and um, he's asking, um, 
Are we not, uh, whether we are really asking the right questions when we call it knowledge production in a data-driven society and shouldn't it be data production in a greed-driven society? Uh, so I think some of the presentations uh, uh, did already um, sort of uh, touch upon this connotation. Um, uh, so he's suggesting, well, it's a question, but it's a comment framed in a question. <laughs> um, isn't one of the biggest problems that knowledge as useful for humanity uh, is useful for humanity and as common good is hamstringed by a greed for data and data control. Well, that's yeah, um, the market in a market uh, profit oriented economy. So what would be, I mean, based on your presentations, your perspectives on the, on the issue, uh, what would be your, uh, your reply on, on this, comment question. <laughs> uh, Nadine, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> that's always a good question. What, what are the right questions to ask? Well, I mean, if, you, if it comes to knowledge comments, obviously, this is already in itself a very ambivalent project as I mean, I guess, you know, commons have been designed as, as something that sort of, yeah, maybe a, an idealistic way to get access to some goods, in particular natural resources at the first place that is not granted for the whole of, of humanity. And the same was then sort of applied to, to knowledge. So in itself, of course, it, it to, to even come or create a concept such as commoning and commons, this is already based on the assumption that we are living in a very capitalist society and that knowledge is companies, nations, empire states um, are trying to sort of restrict and, and sort of also, yeah, steer knowledge production on their own ends. So in that sense, I think this will be an ambivalence that always is there. But what I find interesting is that this, all, this whole concept also grew up, grew out of, of maybe a shortage of, of resources, or at least an assumed shortage of resources during the Cold War. And then was also sort of um, adapted to knowledge, which has increasingly being conceptualized as a, as a sort of good that should be provided for the, the whole of mankind, as in particular the United Nations um, did put it. So in that sense, I think we will never get rid of, of this ambivalence, but can just analyze it if we want to. Yeah. Mm. Yoshiaki, your, any comment on this question or? So I think the trust is consists of authentic, uh, authenticity and control rights of data subject. So you know uh, that personal data is generated just with usage of public post public transportation with uh, IC card or uh, pass purchasing something with credit card. Uh, so. So there must be uh, more and, and there must be more and more data. However, uh, the important to uh, it is the important of uh, guarding uh, human rights. Uh, I think that it is uh, the trust is a trust trust related to technology is very important. So uh, data we. Uh, Free data with uh, data free flow with trust, uh, someone mentions, means not data, all of the data must be open, but all of the data must be controlled by uh, the will of data subject. And so, uh, and I think uh, that deserving uh, the rights of data subject can be realized with technology uh, such as uh, safe sovereign uh, identifier, the decentralized identifier and or trusted web related technologies. So uh, I, I, may, I, um, I pointed, I insisted uh, there must uh, 
the balance of technological uh, technology uh, not not uh, sorry i uh, balance of economical incentives and uh, institutional regulation uh in in, in other words the uh, regulation regulation must be based on the adapting certain technologies and certain common specifications and the such such uh, technology and the specification must be uh, uh, must be according to the, uh, the uh, according to the uh, self sovereign and uh, celebrity and uh, and the control right of data subject is it the right, is it <laughs> appropriate answer <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah so well, one, one aspect would be yeah, to, to make, well, you, as you said, the trust is not just that we have open data, but that, but how can the people make this choice? I mean, uh, uh, how do they know? I mean, how do they really understand what's, what's happening, uh, all the implications? It might be a little bit idealistic or it needs a lot of education, you know, the, the sort of data something? literacy, or um, uh, that's, that's another, probably another big, uh, big topic. May um, I say something in this regard? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, making the choice. I think there are polls that say that people don't want to give the data to Facebook and so on, but they want to be there and they don't want to pay. So most of the people freely give over the data. Now, others say and lawyers say, yeah, you did it freely. You clicked on the, on the EULA. And these are subjects, okay, yes, um, Western, uh, Western, in the Western sense, subjects. On the other hand, people who don't become subjects, who, whose governments don't frame people as subjects, cannot take part in the data free flow of trust or for this is, for them it is not defined, so yeah who is a subject is one question. And then if subjects actually really make that decision freely is something that should be addressed analytically and is often uh, to be answered negatively, sadly. So this is a good example, I think, of where our conventional ways of certain terms, certain practices, have come into a bit of, have hit a wall. So let's take the word copyright from the comment by Florian. It's at the end of the second paragraph, right? Where it talks about copyrights restricted databases by companies and governments. Now, a copyright essentially is a, is a, a permission to, is ownership of an artistic product or uh, after you've made something, you are enabled to, uh, you claim ownership of it. And this is the right that you have is, in, in, in embodied in the form of a copyright, right? That's how we think about it. Now, for anyone who is an artist, anyone who is a musician, this question of uh, copyright is very important. It's their livelihood in effect, right? Uh, but we also know that when it's taken over by somebody else, when you know big corporations take this uh, germplasm from, from a jungle in Indonesia and convert, convert that into a a multi-billion dollar drug product, you know, that's a form of copyright that we're not so sure about, right? What I'm trying to get at here is that we're at the point now where our digital self requires copyright of some kind. We've handed it over through consent. And this is what um, you mentioned a moment ago. What, is, what does consent mean in this moment of, digital, of the digital world, right? Well, if you don't agree to that long list of things when you sign on a new app, it means that your life is much more impoverished compared to your friend who has access to Instagram and Facebook and all these things. Now, you might find that a waste of time and you might find it something that, you know, makes your mind go to mush in five minutes time. But for a young person who's 15 or 16 or 17 years old to be excluded from those platforms is a punishment beyond death, right? How could you bear to be not be on Instagram when all your friends are there? So you're going to consent automatically to do it. But that's not the meaning of consent that we know has meaning. It has meaning in a legal sense, but it does has no meaning in a social sense, right? Because you really have no choice but to be on Instagram or Facebook or whatever the platform of choice is, TikTok, something like that. So 
both the idea of copyright, which comes from a different milieu or world setting, and this idea of consent, both are foundations of the normal legal system as we know it. Both of them, in a sense, have lost meaning and acquired different meaning in this digital world. So this is what I'm saying. We have seems to me very obvious that, in a sense, we have to go back and reconsider these these terms and these conditions uh, and reframe them in order to make the kinds of autonomies and the resistances and in, and responses that Nadine is and and Yoshi are both referring to in different ways to make those more possible, to make those less the exception than the rule. I'll just say one more thing about the, the public and its and the history of the internet. I mean, the history of the internet owes its origins to two publics. One is, of course, the US Defense Department, which is the epitome of a public sector enterprise. And the other is the work of all the engineers and hackers who eventually became something called Silicon Valley, who put the internet together through cooperation and self-help and by sharing and openness. So that was a different kind of transnational public, right? That formed almost spontaneously, you might say, around this new technology and the excitement produced by them. So these two publics, very, very different meanings of public, in a sense, are the origins of where we are today. And perhaps it's no surprise, given this contradictory beginning, on the one hand, a military machine, on the other hand, cooperation of the highest order coming together to produce this deeply flawed but absolutely essential thing we call the internet. And there were also researchers in Switzerland in the in the big uh, in uh, was it the uh, physical physical science huge research uh, lab which uh, participated in ah uh, you mean CERN yeah CERN the CERN yeah. Uh -huh. so but uh, so yeah it was really it was it was the commons in the in the in the beginning was it was governed in that way as well the internet as a commons there were still the domains how the domains and the rules uh, everything. Um, so, um, yeah, we have, um, uh, we have another, another question that relates to, to the issue of consent. What does consent mean in the digital world? Um, uh, my, uh, my idea has always been that we, you know, we kind of leave this to uh, bilateral, well, it looks like a, a consent, like a bilateral kind of negotiation. It is not. It's a unilateral imposition. And then you, 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 you have to say yes, because you want, you want to use it. So uh, I think the only way out would be that we have a, a, a general a legal framework, which doesn't give, uh, which restricts the leeway of, of um, private corporations to define their terms, basically some basic general public uh, terms. Uh, which have to be sorted out in, in a kind of legal process. But then our, then Kelly Langley says, well, how can we rely on the functioning of such legal process if uh, uh, these companies now have enough money to basically uh, buy, uh, uh, buy the legal regulations? Um, any, any response to that? I mean, how, that's, of course, uh, a very bad um, a note to end this uh, <laughs> seminar with. I'll try to get a little bit more positive uh, in the end. Uh, but of course, it's it's a big issue. Now, how we, how can we counterbalance? And uh, and I think there are a lot of initiatives uh, around by experts uh, in the field who want to counterbalance the profit-driven uh, um, uh, sort of actors. Uh, in this process, but uh, do you have any any positive ideas? I mean, um, how to <laughs> how to how to counter this uh, dilemma? How to resolve the dilemma? Iti. Well, I'll just say one word, which is the um, one of the greatest um, <laughs> I I don't have the right word here. I'm going to say tricks because I don't know what the right word is. One of the greatest tricks that these uh, big Silicon Valley corporations have imposed on us is the idea that they can be held unaccountable for the outcomes, real world outcomes of the algorithms and the systems that they use in order to keep us hooked. And I'm thinking of the way, for example, in Myanmar, Facebook is used in order to target different uh, minority communities, used to mobilize people against things that the, the government wants. 
um, and many, many other places. Sri Lanka had a similar outbreak like this recently. And the ability of these large companies to pay no responsibility, to take no responsibility whatsoever for what is clearly built into their algorithm, meaning the tendency towards extremism is something that they know keeps people on board much longer. Uh, and yet they're able to walk away from it saying that they're not responsible for what people say on their platforms. That particular game that they've been able to play, thanks to the support of the US Congress uh, in the first instance, um, is something extraordinary. And I think that if nothing else, if we can get legal accountability built into the system for these uh, large platforms, uh, it's something that we definitely need to do. I mean, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and others, uh, I'm happy they're doing so well, but I think the cost at which that, that success has come uh, has to be measured as well. And uh, there's something needs to be done. Some new form of accountability needs to be produced. Uh, and I, I find that an absolute, one of the most shocking things of the last few years. And it's also worth remembering, this is all very new. You know, 2008, you know, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago is when this all began. So although the origins may have been a little bit older, but really this becomes a global phenomenon just in the last 10 years. So it's not surprising we're still catching up with uh, all the impacts of it. And with more and more information about how these companies do what they do, I hope that movement towards holding them accountable will also follow. Um, perhaps it's going to have to come from Europe rather than from the United States, which tends to just celebrate, you know, corporations under any circumstances. Yeah, Europe has already produced some kind of regulation, a private uh, data protection regulation, but that's, that's just this, you know, this... Uh, consent uh, idea which um, of course it's it's obviously in, insufficient but it's it's one step um, in this direction and of course it's also pushing Facebook maybe a little harder than the US Congress um, yeah may I say something in this regard yes, please yeah um, it's great to have the regulation GDPR but in making it useful employing it, is dependent on when and where you deploy it. And if you say, well, in this regard, we don't really do it, or we don't really enforce it in this regard because of economic interests for all of the country, for all of the um, international economy, then it's a downhill spiral. Because if we have the GDPR, why are we still talking or having fear of sliding into a surveillance society? Why? Because only selective enforcement could be the downhill slope. And um, yes, that is a problem which um, likely is not only resolved from Europe, I can say self-critically as a European. Um, I think it's a global thing that these countries make a fuss about this and this and this, and in the end, the um, power by the monopolies um, is somehow restrained because uh, I think Facebook wanted to give, wanted to uh, protect the data of European citizens more than that in other regions. The, um, the, GDP, the Europeans, well, they could enforce GDPR um, terms, but Indians didn't get that and then Indians um, well demanded the same treatments as the Europeans and this could spread over the world only then um, I think we would get somewhere so the idea can come from the Europeans but then it's global enforcement I think okay I think um, there are no further the questions from the other side. Now we're actually moving towards the question of governance, which is going to be the topic of next week. We should not continue the discussion in this line. We take too much away from <laughs> from uh, our um, event uh, next week, where we talk about governance uh, in in the digital age. And uh, but of course, a lot of these uh, questions are are interrelated. But um, let me, yeah, let me just uh, say that I think we covered a lot of uh, 
a lot of ground here um, and um, we did not get stuck in the, as I said in the beginning, we did not get stuck in the technicalities, uh, but we get stuck in the, in the social and political implications. We could go on and discuss the impacts. Um, uh, actually, I was um, expecting also, Iti, in, in your abstract, you mentioned the implications for liberalism and democracy. Of course, we, we touched upon this. Um, and um, when, I, when I read this, of course, I was reminded of, um, of uh, uh, the bestsellers by, by uh, Yuval Harari, uh, who also uh, actually draws uh, attention to the fact that this technical technological revolution is actually changing uh, the structure of our society and undermining the ideologies that uh, are the foundation of, of a liberal a democratic uh, society. So uh, there's a lot to, to further talk and think about, but um, I think in the end we also, I mean, our in our role as, as social scientists or uh, uh, humanity scholars, I think it's, um, it's important that we, we get a stronger voice <laughs> in, in the public sphere uh, to hopefully uh, influence um, influence uh, developments in a, in, a, in a positive way. And uh, to do so, of course, we need to engage, we need to learn also more about what's going on and not leave it uh, to the experts in the field. So in that sense, I hope that our event <laughs> today in a way contributed um, uh, to this critical, uh, critical discussion. Maybe we raised more questions than we could provide answers, but that's, uh, that's I think, the normal thing in, in when we deal with a subject as complex as um, uh, knowledge production. So again, thank you very much for all your valuable insights and for the discussion. And I hope we stay in touch and uh, continue this in another format, maybe also face-to-face -face, uh, after the pandemic in a hybrid format. Okay, thanks a lot and uh, stay healthy. <laughs>